Um, let me share my screen with y'all. And I'm going to be mad because I don't think this is the screen I want to share, but do it anyway. Um, so you see the slideshow, right? Do y'all see it all right? Whoops. I have to. Are you looking at the slideshow? Can somebody just nod or something? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, if you have any questions, just pipe up and ask them during while I'm doing this. Okay, so here's what we talked about last time. Um, muscle twitch and stuff. I'm going to turn down the sound a minute just because it's being a little, oh, sugar beets. It's being a little loud. Let me go back to the slideshow. Okay. Uh, so um, this is where we ended last time, right? So I want you to take a look. I'm going to move my thing over here. So I'll be standing at the board for some of this. So interesting stuff here. And I want to talk about why it's interesting to me. And this will kind of, what I'm hoping is that this kind of leads us into an understanding of what's going on inside of us and kind of helps you think about it in a different way. So these are the men's world record uh, times in track and field. Okay, if you didn't know what we're looking at here, uh, in the 100 meter dash, the men's world record is 9.58 seconds set by a man named Usain Bolt. Okay, if you know a little bit about track and field, you probably know a little bit about Usain Bolt. Okay, uh, the 200 meter dash, here's the record set by Usain Bolt. And 400 meter dash set by Wade Van Niekerk, 800 meters set by David Rogisha. Now, what I want to bring up here is something that's super interesting to me, and I, I find it really fascinating how it works out. And that is, if you take 100 meters and multiply that by two, you get 200 meters. Math, high level math right there, high level math. If I take this time, Usain Bolt's time in the 100 meter dash, and I multiply it by two, I get 19.16 seconds, or almost exactly this is world record time for the 200 meters. In fact, if you look at this, uh, if you look at this, this is the wind and the wind was actually in his face in the hundred in the 200 meters and with him in the hundred meters. So you can see that essentially the 200 meter time is exactly double the 100 meter time, which kind of makes sense, right? If you're this fast for hundred meters, you should be the same speed twice right but let's look at what happens when we get to 400 and 800 interestingly in the 400 meter dash it's not Usain Bolt that holds the record right it's some other guy and um you'll also see that 400 meters is two times 200 meters right but if we multiply Usain Bolt's record by two, we get 38.38 seconds. So our world record time is 4.6 seconds less than, or sorry, greater than what it theoretically could be, right? Because theoretically, if Usain Bolt can run 200 meters in 19.19, he should be able to run 400 meters in 38.38, but he can't. In fact, nobody in the world ever has. That's interesting. Another interesting fact is that the person who holds the 800 meter record is not the same as the person that holds the 400 meter record. And that even though that 800 meters is two times 400 meters, if you multiply this by two, you get 86 seconds, basically, which is one minute, 26 seconds. This time, is basically 15 seconds, 15 seconds slower. 15 seconds in an 800 meter dash means that you are like a quarter of the track ahead of the next person. That's crazy. So they're going very much slower the farther they go. Okay, in other words, the farther, the longer you run, the slower you go. And you already instinctively know that I understand. 
they already instinctively know that. But here's evidence, right? This is data that shows that the slower, the longer you run, the slower you go after a certain point. Okay, let's keep that in mind when we talk about um, energy used by muscles. Okay, now on this slide, before you write anything down, I'm going to talk about each one of these, okay, as a separate like point. So you're going to want to leave, if you're writing this down in your notebook, you're going to want to leave like three lines under this and three lines under this. And uh, let's leave about five lines. Well, this is the last thing we're going to talk about today. So you're going to want to leave a little room under that too. Okay, so go ahead and take a minute and write down. Make sure you just leave space under each of them. So write down the first step is ATP. The second step is creatine phosphate. Third step is glycogen storage. And then 3A, lactic acid fermentation, which we'll come back to. So I'll give you about, about two minutes right now to write that down. And then I'll go to the next slide. Are we good? Can I go? Just say no, otherwise I'm going. Okay. Step one, ATP. We'll come back, by the way, to that too, by the way. Okay. Step one, ATP. So if I were to take off right now and sprint to the door, I have enough ATP in my muscles to last for about one second of full speed contraction. Okay, if I do biceps curls, I have enough energy stored in my muscles for about one second of full speed contraction. So for one second, I use up my ATP store. I'll give you a minute to write that down. Can I click? Step two is something called creatine phosphate. You may know somebody who supplements with creatine phosphate. Okay, what creatine phosphate does and how it works is it's a chemical that's stored in your muscles. It can donate its phosphate to ADP. The result is one ATP and one creatine. It's the second fastest energy, but only for 15 to 20 seconds. But what it does is it means that there's no oxygen or glucose required. And I'll explain in a second. I'll let you write that down, then I'll explain in a second. I'll do some writing on the slide while you're doing that. So creatine phosphate is a chemical that's naturally, you get from your food and naturally made by your body. And it's stored, it's basically a way to store energy in your muscles without energy. And I don't want to get into the biochemistry of why it's just not ATP stored in your muscles, but creatine phosphate then donates a phosphate to ADP. It's like sort of charges up the battery without using electricity. Okay, it'd be like if you could charge your cell phone with no electricity. All right, so the result is ATP and one creatine. 
So the creatine has gotten rid of his waste. The key to this is for about 15 to 20 seconds, you don't need oxygen or sugar. You use up the creatine stored in your muscles. Okay? Use up the creatine stored in your muscles. Just a minute. I have somebody at the door. I'll be right back. Okay. Any questions about that? So far. All right. Step three. Let me go back. Maybe. So step three is glycogen storage. Uh, we didn't really talk about glycogen before. Glycogen is a sugar molecule that's made of a chain of glucoses. So you have stored in your muscles, basically sugar stored in your muscles. And that sugar stored in your muscles then, each one of these sugar molecules can be used to make 38 ATP. And so you use up your ATP, use up your creatine. Now you have to do cell respiration. Okay. Remember cell respiration, C6H12O6, food plus oxygen yields CO2, H2O, and ATP. And this takes time, but you start doing it in your muscle cells as soon as you start exercising. You start you ramp up cell respiration, but there's a limit, remember? And the limit is how much oxygen you can get. So if you're going full speed, right? You are limited by the amount of oxygen you can get to a muscle cell. And what happens next is lactic acid fermentation, right? And so uh, let me click back ahead to number three. Lactic, we already talked about cell respiration in detail. Lactic acid fermentation occurs when supplies of oxygen are low. This is a bit of review. So you don't have enough oxygen for cell respiration, like when you're sprinting. That, may, that produces two ATP for every glucose, and of course we get lactic acid. But the key here is the energy from that lasts about 30 to 60 seconds. I'll let you write that down a minute. Okay, I don't know why my screen's lagging, sorry to you. I'm gonna to move to the next slide. Didn't hear anything, so. So remember that we thought lactic acid would promote fatigue and muscle soreness, but now we know that during activity, the body uses lactic oxygen to break down the lactic acid and use it for fuel somewhere else, not just your muscles. So your brain still needs fuel. So, so all of your, if you're really exerting yourself muscularly, you are sending your glucose to the muscles, but the rest of your body still needs fuel. And that's where lactic acid comes in. Now I'll leave this on the screen again for you to write for a couple seconds.
I'll take a few minutes and go over this graph next time because it actually is pretty interesting, but it's a little confusing to look at. Can I go or not? Okay. So last thing for today, something called the anaerobic threshold then, and then I'll kind of tie it all together at the end. What I want you to do is sketch this graph into your notes. Uh, the left-hand side is blood lactate. That's the amount of lactic acid in your blood. X-axis is running speed, okay? And I don't care that you know the numbers, although it'd be 11.8 is kind of an important number to know, but you don't have to like write all these out. Just the idea that it goes up, it starts very slow and gets faster as we go. And then I'll explain what the graph means in a minute. The definition of anaerobic threshold they just put on the screen too. Are we good or you need more time? Okay. So what's happening here is they put a person on a treadmill. Okay. And they started the treadmill at four kilometers an hour. That is about as slow as a treadmill goes. Okay. And then they also measured how much lactic acid is in their blood, okay? So how much lactic acid is being produced by their muscles in their blood? And you'll see that as they ramped up the speed, there's no time on here. I don't know how long they did this for, but as they kept moving the speed up, the person's lactic acid in their blood would go up very slowly, right? That kind of makes sense. They're gonna produce, they're gonna, they're gonna do a little bit of fermentation because, but they're breathing relatively normally. They don't really change anything. But then notice at 11.8, all of a sudden, the amount of lactic acid in their blood starts to increase. And, it, and as they speed up, when they get here, they are kicking out five times more lactic acid than they did when they were going at 10, even though it's only two times faster. Well, what does this mean? This means that at this speed, they suddenly got to the point where their muscles could not keep up with the amount of oxygen they need. They could not keep up using plain old cell respiration. So remember, in the first one second, you use up all your ATP. In the next 20 seconds, you use up all your creatine. So cell respiration, food and oxygen have to keep up. But when you get to a certain speed, they can't keep up anymore and you start producing lactic acid. 
That number right there is called the anaerobic threshold. And it's different for everybody. Okay, it's different for everybody, depending on what kind of shape you're in. And tomorrow, we're going to talk about what that what that means as far as fitness and how what goes on inside of your muscles and all that stuff. Are there that's it for our lecture today? Are there any questions about that? Okay. What happens when you're trying to get air but are underwater? Is that a, if that's a serious question, it's you're dead because you drown. No, you're inhaling water into your lungs. You're not producing any. And so what happens is your brain your brain goes first. So what happens is you lose consciousness first because your brain runs out of oxygen and can't produce any ATP. That is a question for the respiratory system, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. Months, a couple months. Okay, um, 